Welcome to the teaching ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. Pastor Baker is fulfilling the call of God on his life to preach the Word of God without compromise. Raising up disciples who, through faith in God, will have a powerful impact on our world. May you be blessed through the message that Pastor Baker has to share with you today. May God's very best be yours. Go to Jeremiah. Amen. I want to redirect our, our uh, plans here for just a moment, if you would. Jeremiah, if you would turn there. Let me find the exact verse that I want to find here. Glory to God. I said, glory to God. Should know. There we go. Jeremiah 29. Go to Jeremiah 29. Now, I know this was directly given to the children of Israel in Jeremiah's day, but God hasn't changed as it relates to his kids, his people. And we're going to talk a lot about this first key thing here, but I want to touch on this uh, first of all, just to explain about what we're going to get into in referencing our New Year's checklist and especially relating to the plan of God. All my life as a believer, uh, you know, I, 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 at Christmas time, I posted a deal. Uh, 1985 is when I first received my true Christmas present, and I thank God for it ever since. Amen. And, and, you know, there is no doubt that without, without a doubt through that time frame of my life as a believer... Uh, grateful God kept me away from a lot of false teachings and stuff, but you would hear some stuff trickle in once in a while, you know, about things that obviously people were teaching you that wasn't true. But I want you to know this before you ever even thought about receiving Jesus as your savior, before you took your first breath, God already knew you and he had a purpose for you and he knew you would be here. But each time a new year comes around, I like what Terry Mize says. It's like God just gave you 12 new checks. And so how are you going to use them? How are you going to spend each of those months, those opportunities God's given you? I hope it's to fulfill His purpose and plan, what He wants for you. Amen? Jeremiah 29, verse 11, God speaking through the prophet Jeremiah said, For I know the thoughts. Now, the Hebrew there says plans. Plans. For I know the plans that I think toward you, says the Lord. Plans of peace. Peace. Not of evil. To give you a future and a hope, to give you a future and a hope. Some people would tell you, well, you know, in God's plan, he's got some hardships for you to go through and difficult things to face. That ain't what that said. He said, I've got plans for peace, not evil. I've got plans to give you a future and a hope. Now notice verse 12. Then you will what? Call upon me and go and do what? Underline that. Go and pray. Say it. Go and pray. We're going to reference that in just a minute. Go and pray, he said to me, and I will do what? I will do what? Now, this relates to you and me praying about the fact that God has a plan already said. Listen, God already has an established plan for every one of you for 2020. The deal is not for you to try to work your plan. The deal is to find out what is that plan and get in it. If that's your heart's desire, if you have a heart's desire to get in that plan, then how do you find out? Go and call to Him. Go and pray to me, and I will listen. Verse 13, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me. Underline it, please, with all your heart. So what he's saying is, is if you want to find out His plan, you truly have to have a heart set totally on Him and nothing but Him and His desire for you. As a believer, you should have no aspect of your heart in any way, shape, or form wanting to do anything other than what God is going to direct you to do for your life, period. And especially going into the new year. Now go to Matthew 6. Go to Matthew 6. Say, God's got a good plan for me, but I must seek Him to find it. It's not just going to pop into being. It's not just going to manifest. It's not just going to happen. You've got to diligently seek Him and truly do it with all your heart. If you do, He'll listen and He'll answer and He'll start giving you the aspects of that plan. When we talk about God's plan, realize He doesn't give you every part of it. He'll give you what you need to know. He'll give you what are the key elements of what are important as to what He has for you. And as that relates to what we're talking about, we're just talking about 2020. 
Because if I walk in God's plan in 2020, what's 2021 going to look like? Even better. What if I miss God in 2020? Then I'm going to be a little behind when it comes to 2021. But what if I'm walking in His plan in 2020? I'm going to be right where He wants me. And that's going to be what? Plans that are not of evil. Plans that are good. Peace. Plans of peace. Amen. Plans of a future and a hope. Matthew 6. I'm going to give you a checklist. I'm going to give you a checklist of things you should do every year as you enter into a new year. I'm going to touch on the key elements. We've touched on a lot of different things over the years. But I'm going to touch on kind of narrowing this down to the key things that you really need to focus on to go through a New Year's checklist on. Matthew 6, verse 16. If you're there, say amen. amen. Jesus said, moreover, underline these three words, please, when you fast. It's not an option. You can make it one, but he didn't say if you feel like it. He didn't say if it works out for you. He didn't say if you think you can suffer through the hunger pains, might want to try this. He said when you fast. Every believer should live what's known as a fasted life. We should not just be fasting in January at the start of the year. We should have consistent times of fasting and prayer to hear from the Father, hear from the Lord. Moreover, when you fast, listen to this, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance. Don't go around, you know, people like, man, you're looking kind of down. Yeah, man, my pastor's got us fasting for three days. That's, you, just, you just ended your reward from God. Are you here? Don't go around like a hypocrite with a sad countenance. They disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward, but it ain't hearing from God. 17, but you, say me, me. underline the three words again, when you fast. So twice now he has told us that you should do so. When you fast, fast, anoint your head and wash your face. Now you don't have to anoint your head. I, I think it's a good idea to wash your face once in a while, praise the Lord, just to get the dirt and stuff off of the day. But what he's saying is don't put on this Again, this uh, look like I'm really going through a hard time here because I'm fasting, you know, for God. No, he's saying just do what you normally do. Verse 18, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting. Now, let me interject something right at the start so I don't forget it because usually by the time I get rolling, I'll forget it. So let me get it in here right away. All right. If you live in a home with somebody else that you share meals together, you should let them know you're fasting. And you should let them know what meals you are fasting. This is not saying you've ruined your ability to get from God what He wants to speak to you. If I go and tell my wife, hey, my wife already knows, obviously, for those three days, don't even think about preparing food for me because I'm not eating. But if this is new to you and you're just taking off like a lunch or a dinner or something like you would normally have a spouse that would make a meal for you or you would have a meal together, you should tell them. Here's my plan for the fast days. And these are the days that I plan to not be eating. So don't plan on dinner with me because otherwise then they show up, make a big meal. You show up. Well, I'm not eating tonight. And they get all upset because they made all this food. Well, why didn't you tell me? So that's not what it's referring to. But it is saying that you and I should not go sound a trumpet. Hey, I'm fasting. Glory, aren't aren't we doing that? No, we're calling a fast. Outside of this church, we're not running around telling everybody what we're doing. Obviously, the live stream people here, but you know what I'm saying. We're not going around telling everybody. So again, don't, you don't want to just appear to men to be fasting, but to your father who is, underline this, play, underline this place, in the secret. The word place is added, but implied in the secret place. Now, that's a key. He's tying that to fasting. Why does he bring it up in reference to fasting? Because it's a key thing if you want to truly experience the benefit of what fasting is all about. So he says again, you should not do so to just appear to men be fasting, but to your father who is where? Where is he at? He's in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will do what? What will he do? He rewards you openly. He will hold nothing back. He will reveal to you what he has desired to reveal to you, of what he wants for you to walk out as a child of God. Amen? Amen. All right, I'm going to go ahead and give you the first part of our New Year's checklist, and then we're going to go some more, over quite a few more verses about this. Number one, going into the new year, you should fast and pray. 
Well, I already knew that, Pastor. Wonderful. Write it down anyway. <laughs> Number one, you should fast and pray. Don't just fast. Right. What did you just talk about in relationship to fasting? Your father who's in the secret place, if you go into that secret place, will reward you openly. If you're not going to get with the father in the secret place, your fasting is nothing more than you getting hungry and not eating food. So it really is not going to accomplish what God intended for it to accomplish as you're about to see in the Word of God. If you back up in the same chapter before he got to that point, he talks about this secret place and explains it a little better back here in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 5. In Matthew 6, verse 5, he said, When you pray, notice this, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corner of the streets that they may be seen by men. Now, it's not wrong for us to pray together, but we're not doing it just to try to prove to somebody, look how spiritual I am. No. Amen. Surely I say to you, they have their reward, but you, when you pray, do what? Go into your room. When you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is where? Yes. So this ties to fasting. Again, fast and pray. You are to spend time praying to your Father in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret again will do what? Reward you openly. So he clearly is talking about this in relationship to fasting in verses 16 through 18. When you pray, do not use what? Don't use vain repetition. Don't sit there and ask God over and over and over, give, him, give me the plan. Give me the plan, God. God, I need the plan. Need the plan, God. God, I need the plan. I sure need the plan. Sure hope you show me your plan. Need the plan, God. You're not going to get anything by doing that. Right. You don't go and pray to God through vain repetition. So again, he said, when you pray, don't use vain repetition as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your father what? He knows the things you have need of before you ask him. What is the secret place? Well, sad to say years ago, I heard a very famous minister say, now if you want to get in the secret place of prayer, you have to realize if you go back to the times of the New Testament, Jesus had what was called a prayer shawl. And he would take that prayer shawl and he would cover himself with it when he would go into prayer and that would put him in the secret place. So if you want to get in the secret place with the Father, you need a prayer shawl. And by the way, we happen to sell them, $29.95, and you can get a prayer shawl. I almost puked. I mean, that's ridiculous. The secret place is not you having to have a prayer shawl. What did he just tell you to do? He didn't say anything about a prayer shawl. He said, go into your room. I'm not making fun. I'm just telling you. A lot of people say things that aren't even biblical. Go into your room. Shut the door. What's the secret place? Are you ready? Are you ready? It's where it's just you and God. It's that simple. It's a private time, a private time with you and God. The other definition for the word secret is a private, a private place. My point is you're not going to be real effective doing this if you are actually being distracted all the time by children and dogs and cats and everything else. Cell phones, social media. I don't encourage you to take your cell phone into your prayer time. Come on. Why? It rings and dings and does all those things. And then you're going to say, well, I better check it out because after all, somebody might need me. Isn't it amazing? We live without them for years. And now all of a sudden we got to have them with us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. and Can't get rid of them. Now, again, I know this can be a challenge for families, but this is where I would consider a trade off. Where one night, one parent obviously gets the opportunity to watch the kids. And the other parent gets to go in a private room somewhere and get quiet before the Lord and spend some time in prayer. Here's the key to this secret place. You have to quiet your mind. You have to quiet your mind. God is a spirit. He does not relate to your mind. He relates to your spirit. He does not bear witness with your mind. To get God's plan, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to hear it coming up out of your spirit, man. Not in your brain. He does not relate to your brain. He relates to your spirit. Are you still here? Because if he related to our brain, then obviously anybody could hear from him fairly easily. But the difficulty would be, we would have to say, is it God or is it the devil? Because guess what? The devil comes to you with thoughts, ideas, and suggestions. And the Bible says he comes as an angel of light. So it may sound good, but God's not going to bring his plans to you through your brain. He's going to bring him through your spirit. 
And obviously, once they come up out of your spirit, yes, you can get understanding with your mind as well, but it's going to come out of your spirit. Well, guess what that means? The most significant thing about this prayer time is you've got to learn to quiet yourself before the Lord. I'm not going in there to spend all my time talking. I'm going in there to listen and to hear. And that's why uh, for a lot of people, fasting and prayer is difficult because one, you're already dealing with your flesh. And then two, on top of that, most people have a difficult time getting quiet before the Lord. So I don't encourage for you to have music playing in the background. If you really want that and that helps you, but most people, that's just another distraction, even if it is worship music. You're going to have to learn to shut the world off. The secret place is you shut everything else off, including your brain, and you're hearing from God. Amen. Now, let me just interject a couple little helps here. All right. What's the best way to start that time of prayer, Pastor? First of all, God knows because, again, he knows what you have need of before you ask him, but he still tells us to ask. So when you come, say, Father, I'm coming to spend time with you to get your plan for 2020. That's right. Amen. Let him know your intent. Yes. I want to hear from you. Yes. I have a desire to know your plan for 2020, what you have laid out for me, what you want me to know. And that's what I'm coming to this prayer time to do is to just sit and hear from you of what you desire of me. Amen. Amen. For me, what I've learned through people like Brother Hagen, through our pastor, through others of our spiritual dads, I begin that time of prayer thanking Him and praising Him for everything that He's done for me, how good He's been to me. I don't spend a lot of time, but I begin, first of all, by an attitude of praise and worship to God. Then I go into a time of praying in the Spirit. And I'm going to tell you why, because I want to hear from my spirit man. And praying in the Spirit is like putting up your spiritual antenna to start tuning into the spirit realm. Because when you pray in the Spirit, who's doing the praying? Your spirit is. And that's the part of you that you want to hear from God. So when you start praying the spirit, who begins to dominate in that moment? Your spirit does. Now, I encourage you, whenever you pray in the spirit, as you're taking time to pray and talk to God, should you be allowing your mind to think about other things? No. What should you do with your mind? Make it listen to what you're praying. You're not trying to figure it out with your brain. You're just trying to get your brain to quiet down so you can get focused on the things of the spirit. Amen? Amen. Now, I would not do that for hours and then only spend five or ten minutes to hear from God and come out of your prayer chamber. Are you listening? I would start that way because it can direct you into the realm of the Spirit. But at some point, you're going to have to get quiet. The purpose of this secret place of fasting and prayer is to spend far more time listening than you do talking. Because I want to hear from Him. I want to hear His plan. That's why we actually stretch this out to three days because if you don't do it regularly, you probably won't hear nothing the first day. <clears throat> I'm not trying to discourage you, <clears throat> but it'll take you, obviously, in most cases, a couple of days yeah. just consistently fasting and praying to get quiet before the Lord. Tune everything else out. <clears throat> not trying to discourage you, just telling you that's a fact for most people. Amen? Amen. But I'm just telling you, you got to do what? You got to get quiet before the Lord <clears throat> and you got to quiet your mind. Pastor, what if I start praying in the Spirit, I fall asleep? Guess what? You fell asleep praying in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. That ain't a bad thing. No. I said, that ain't a bad thing. No. And guess what? Your spirit can still hear from God. Now, I wouldn't go in there planning to take a snooze. That's <laughs> not what I would plan on doing. <laughs> oh, see, Pastor gave me permission. I can just go to sleep. God will just download to me. No. But I wouldn't get upset with yourself if it happens. Some people really get upset with themselves. Let me help you. No better way to fall asleep than praying in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. But I don't take much more than five, ten minutes for me once I start praying in the Spirit to pray in the Spirit. That's it. And then I get quiet before the Lord. Now, let me help you. I wouldn't get in a position that's painful. You know, some people, I got to be on my knees. There's no verse that says you only hear from God when you're on your knees. The Bible actually refers more to lifting of hands and praying than it does on your knees. So realize this. Now understand if you're tired, it might be helpful to get up and just walk around, but be quiet. So it's okay to even walk and listen for God. Amen? But almost every single time I've heard from God, it's when I finally settled down and got quiet. And I actually, again, learned this from Brother Hagin. I get into a comfortable position where, I'm, where my body's not messing with me. You know, where I'm not feeling pain in my knees or something like that. Because then you know what you're thinking about. You're thinking about the pain in your body. 
Again, your mind is focused on something that's distracting you from hearing from God. So the more you can quiet your mind, the better off you'll be. And for me, man, that's in my office, in a position, in my chair, nothing else around, nobody else around. And thank God school's out during that time, so I don't have any school kids to deal with on Friday over here in the park. And I can just sit, simply relax and listen to God and hear in my heart what God's saying. Amen. Does that help you at all? Yes. So the first thing of our checklist is to do what? Fast and pray. Get it on your checklist that I need to fast and pray. Why? I'm going to show you why. I want you to go to Ezra. Ezra chapter 8. It's one of the greatest examples in the Bible of fasting and prayer. Ezra. Go to Ezra. Ezra, in his day, were bringing the children of Israel back from Babylon captivity. Babylonian captivity. And he had told the king of that day, our God will see to it that he gets us back home safely. And the king then offered to actually send a recruitment of uh, protective soldiers to go with him to take him back. And he's like, no, 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 I've already told him that my God will protect us, but we need to hear from God the plan of how we're supposed to do that. And so Ezra was smart enough to know, good idea, good time to call a fast of all the people of Israel so we can hear from God. Ezra 8, Ezra chapter 8, verse 21. Ezra 8, 21. Then I proclaimed, Ezra did, I proclaimed a fast there. Notice God didn't tell him to. I said, God didn't. It doesn't say God told me to. He said, I, he just knew. I, we got to hear from God. What's the best thing you can do? Proclaim a fast. I want to hear from God about his plans for me in 2020. How about you? So we're proclaiming a fast. You don't have to do it. Nobody's forced to do it. But he proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might do what? Humble ourselves. Humble ourselves before our God, underline this please, to seek from Him the right way. To seek from Him the right way. When you got God's plan, guess what you got? You got the right way. If it ain't God's plan, guess what? It's the wrong way. So he said, we are fasting and praying to seek from God the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions. For I was ashamed, verse 22, to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road because we had spoken to the king saying, the hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him, but his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. Verse 23, so we did what? Fasted. We fasted and entreated. That's praying. That's praying. We fasted and entreated our God for this. What were they seeking from him? For the right way, his plan, notice this, golly, Gomer, check out this at the end of the verse. And he answered our prayer and he will answer yours. If you truly have a heart to hear from God and what his plan is, guess what? He will answer your prayer, especially when you make a commitment to fast and pray and you show him, I'm serious about fasting and praying. So let's talk about fasting for a minute. Why is it important to fast? Well, the whole term fast simply means, if you look it up, to abstain from food. That is the primary definition of fasting. It is to abstain from food. When I'm fasting, what am I doing? Not eating. You are not eating. So you're abstaining from some type of food. Why? Because your body is flesh and it desires to be fed. And when it desires to get uh, fed and it gets hungry, guess what? It starts speaking to you. And when you fast, you know what you're telling your body? You don't rule me. You don't control me. I can actually go without a meal and survive and still live. Amen. So it's important to understand that fasting is a abstinence of food because we're dealing with the flesh part of us so we can tune into God to find out what? God's plan. Let me show you some powerful verses that will go with this to help you out. Go to Proverbs uh, 18, excuse me, 19, Proverbs 19. Why is this so important, Pastor? I'm going to show you. Go to Proverbs 19. Say, I want to know God's plan. If you're really serious about it, then you're going to be serious about fasting and praying these three days. And doing what? Getting into the secret place. What's the secret place? Uninterrupted. Uninterrupted by external things. Uninterrupted in your mind. 
uninterrupted in the context of your social media and your, your phones and all that kind of stuff. So I encourage you to leave all that stuff out. Find a place. Well, that's hard for me, Pastor. Well, find somewhere. Find a time to do it. Hey, listen. People tell me, you know, but I live in a neighborhood. There's so much noise and stuff. Time I go to bed, you know, it's still loud around there. I would encourage you to take a couple hours out during the early morning hours or late at night when everybody else is asleep. I'm going to show you right now that it's worth it to get God's plan. And if it means you got to sacrifice some sleep, it's worth it. But if you don't get in the secret place, you're not going to hear from God. <clears throat> Are you listening? Uh, one of the things that you're going to be challenged with that the enemy will see to it. He does this to me every single year. He starts bringing phone calls my way and things people want me to, the pe people want to hear, talk to me about, whatever. And I oftentimes in the past have caved in and thought, well, I don't want to put it off. It's not an emergency, but okay. And next thing you know, man, my time starts getting consumed. I get to the end of the day and I didn't spend the time in prayer that I wanted to. And I've learned when I go into this day of these three days of fasting and prayer, if you don't have an emergency, I'm not answering your call. <clears throat> I'm not calling you back. If you call me and you're not like 911 and headed to the hospital, then I'm on my way. But if it's just a problem you're having, you're not going to hear from your pastor because I've learned that I don't mean the enemy's using you, but I've just learned how, how all of a sudden the enemy tries to distract you with things and you got to realize you got to commit this time to God. Amen. Amen. So I encourage you to do it, praise God. Amen. Proverbs 19, let me show you just how valuable and important it is to get God's plan. Even if you have to get up 1, 2 in the morning, spend some time. What's the quietest time on the, on the, on the whole planet? Does anybody know? 3 a.m. It's one of the quietest times on the planet. So you know what? It won't hurt you to get up for an hour or two. Right? Right? We go, we go do things of our own nature sometimes that cost us a couple hours sleep, you know, that we would go do something else of uh, our own desire. I'll tell you what, hearing from God's way better. Amen. Uh, Proverbs 19, 21. There are many plans in a man's heart. Turn your neighbor and say, that includes you. I don't care who you are. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're born again or not. There are many plans. So you got to realize none of those are of God. He didn't say that there's many plans of God in a man's heart. He said there's many plans in a man's heart. A man has many plans. Just part of our makeup as an individual, as a, as a being God created, to obviously keep coming up with ideas and plans. Notice this. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel. Now the word there is referring to His plan. If you got God's counsel, guess what you got? His plan. Listen, the Lord's counsel, that will Stand. You know what that means? Mine won't. My plans are temporary. My plans can be defeated. My plans can be overcome. But guess, who pl guess whose plans can never be overcome? If I work them, his plan can never be defeated. I can start working his plan. It looks like it's not working. But if I know, and this is what's key, if I know I got his plan, I have something that cannot be defeated. It will stand. The only way that it won't is if I quit on the plan. If I give up on the plan. This is why it's so important. How many of you, if you knew that you knew 110% that you heard from God of a plan that He has for you of 2020 would be able to stick with it knowing I heard from God. There's no way I'm going to back down from this because I know it's what He said. It's not an issue of us not wanting to do it. It's an issue of us have we really heard from God or not. But this is why it's so important to get his plan. Because guess whose plan is going to stand? It ain't yours. It ain't mine. And whether you believe it or not, you've already got a lot of plans in your heart for 2020. I do. But you know what? I got to go into this time of fasting and prayer and say, is that your plan? Is that what you want? Go to Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29. Even in ministry, man, I've had a lot of plans, a lot of things that have come to me that I've thought about. Man, let's do this. Let's try that. And we've done it. And you know what? It doesn't mean in some ways you might not stumble on something that God has for you. But that's not the real way to do it. Because obviously you're just going through the motions of trying to find out if it's God or not. Well, trying it's not the best way to do that. Getting in prayer and knowing it's God is the best way to do that. Anytime you have a plan that's not of God, guess what it's going to cost you? Number one, first and foremost, time. And you don't have any more to give. 
It's going to cost you time. The moment that I have a plan that's not of God and I'm working that plan, I'm already costing myself valuable time that I could be working God's plan, but I'm not. I'm working mine. So this is why it's so important. Guess what else it usually costs you? Money. Almost always costs you money. In some way, shape, or form, uh, it tends to cost you money. Now, it can cost you other things besides that, but those are two of the most valuable things it takes away from you. Look at Proverbs 29, and I'm going to show you what you need to do in relationship to these plans. Proverbs 29, where there is no revelation, the word actually there is referenced in the Hebrew as a prophetic vision. What's a prophetic vision? God's plan. If I have a prophetic vision, I have a plan from God. So those who have no prophetic vision, a plan from God, those people do what? They cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law. This is a powerful verse. You're looking at a verse that literally tells you something significant about God's plans for your life and whether they'll work or not. Number one, if I have God's plan, it will stand if I work it. Isn't that right? But those who do not have God's plan cast off restraint. You want to know another way to say that? They have no plan. They have no, well, I got a plan, but you have no way to fulfill the plan because you don't have a plan from God. You might have an idea of what to do. Casting off restraint means there's going to be no self-discipline to carry this out. Even when times it don't look like it's working. Again, what I just told you, if I've got a plan from God and I know it's from God, then guess what? I'm not going to cast off restraint. I'm going to stay disciplined. Seriously, if you knew 110% what God told you to do was something he told you to do, would you do it or not? Sure you would. Sure you would. You wouldn't cast off restraint. You would put yourself under a position to say, I'm sticking with this no matter what, because I know it's God. That's why it's so important you hear from God. And he goes on to say, if you don't have that vision, you would cast off restraint. You're not going to be diligent to fulfill it. But happy is he who does what? Keeps the law. That means God's instructions. What's the plan? God's instructions. What if I keep that plan? I'm going to be happy. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Come on. Not in the sense of what Wes asked about what's happiness and the difference between happiness and joy. Well, it will make you happy too because guess what? You're going to be walking out what God planned for you. Right. Yeah. Amen. 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 Knowing I'm going down the right path. <clears throat> so it's important to understand what he's telling you here. If you get a vision from God, that's good. But guess what? Now that you have the plan of God, guess what you got to do? You got to get a plan for the plan. Are you listening to me? You got to have a plan to fulfill it. Once I know what that plan is, how am I going to do that? How am I going to fulfill that? God expects you to start making a plan to fulfill that. Proper, come on, SMTI students. Planning prevents. What if you don't plan for the plan? If you don't plan for the plan, you won't fulfill it. You won't see it carried out. And that's where we got to know not only what his plan is, but have his instructions to be able to follow that out and to see how to fulfill it. Amen. If you do, you will be happy. I said you will be happy. Go to Habakkuk. (laughs) We're still on the first one, man. We're still on fast and pray. Why? Because it's the most significant. It's the most significant of the checklist of how to hear and get God's plan. And I just showed you why it's so important to get it. If I've got God's plan, I've got something that will stand. But it's not only important I get it, I've got to also do what? I've got to have a plan for the plan. How do I carry that out? What's my next step? What do I do first? Then what do I do after that? Then what do I do after that? Most plans aren't like one step and they're fulfilled. Are you listening to me? I'm getting a plan to build a building. Anybody excited about that? There's a lot of steps involved in that plan. I got to know what's the next step. Not what the world tells me. I mean, I got to go to their council as as far as some of that's involved. But I got to know what God's telling me our next step is. 
Amen. If I don't hear from God and hear what God's next step is on this, then guess what? I'm not going to be able to follow his instruction to fulfill the plan. That would not be good. Habakkuk 2. Habakkuk, or some call it Habakkuk. Habakkuk 2, minor prophet, not far from the New Testament. Minor prophet. Habakkuk 2. If you're there, say amen. Amen. I want you to look at verse 2. I know you know these verses, but you need to be reminded of them. The Lord answered me and said, do what? Write the, write the. Okay, so just a moment ago, we found out if you don't have a vision, you won't have restraint. You won't have any diligence to fulfill it. But if I get a vision, I now have the ability to have the diligence to fulfill it. What do I need to do when I get the vision? You need to write it down. That's why you have a God's goal sheet. But that's not enough. That's just the start. God's goal sheet is the overall goal of what he wants to see fulfilled. It's not how to fulfill it. I said it's not how to fulfill it. It's just the overall goal. Are you listening? If I had an overall goal given me, you know, given me by God to build a building, wonderful. But you know what? I'm going to have to have a lot of steps. Okay, so there's the overall goal, but now I got to sit down and plan with God's help the steps to get there. And I got to write those steps out. The reason most people never accomplish goals is because they won't do what the Bible said. They won't do what the Bible said. Notice again, he said to do what? Write that, that vision down. Make it what? Plain. Make it plain on tablets that he may run Who reads it? It will help you to see it fulfilled if you keep looking at it. That's why you have the goal sheets when you go to your prayer time throughout the year. And you got to start making a plan of how to fulfill those goals. We'll go back over uh, for Valentine's this year. Isn't it amazing that that, that, uh, the day after Christmas that stores already got Valentine's stuff out? The day after Christmas, I'm in Walmart and there's Valentine's stuff everywhere. At Valentine's, I am going to give you again how to have a solid, strong marriage. And when we go through that constant teaching with people, we talk about what some key elements are that you have to know of what God called for you to do as a husband or wife. It's good to know what those elements are. But you know what? If you don't look at where you're weak and make a plan, how are you going to change that? This is why most never do. That's why most never do. They might even be, be able to quote to you what a husband or wife should do, but you know why they're not doing it? They've never made a plan to change those areas that they're weak in to start getting better at them. Y'all look at me like a calf looking at a new gate. You have to write out a plan of how you're going to fulfill what God's given you as a goal. What's my next step? Accomplish that. Okay, God, now what do I do next? Amen. Amen. You got to keep doing what? Writing the vision, plain on tablets, so you can run with it. Verse 3, the vision is yet for an appointed time. It is for an appointed time. What you're believing to hear from God is for what's coming up in 2020. For that appointed time. Notice, at the end it will speak, it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. That means it won't be late. It won't be late. If you stick with this, it won't be late. It'll be fulfilled just as God told you. Verse 4, behold the proud. Say, I don't want to be that person. His soul is not upright in him, but the just shall do what? How are you going to fulfill and live out God's plan? By faith. Think about everything we've taught you about faith this year. And realize if you don't apply faith to God's plan... It won't come to pass. You got to get that plan in your heart. You got to speak that over your life. You got to decree and thank God for that plan being fulfilled. And you got to act upon that plan because faith requires action. So understand this very clearly. I'm I'm still under point number one of our checklist about fasting and praying so we can get God's plan. What, What should we do when we get the plan here? According to Habakkuk chapter 2, he just told you four things. One, write it down. Get it on paper somewhere 
So you can see, and how, how can you, it's amazing to me how many people think they can. How can you consistently exercise faith in something that you don't keep before you? Write that vision so you can run with it. So number one, get it written down. Write down your God-given goals. Number two, what do you do? You're going to do what? Make it plain on tablets that you can do what? Run with it. You know what that means? Number two, make a plan and have a plan. Make a plan and have a plan. Make a plan. Obviously, what is God's plan? And then have a plan. How am I going to fulfill that? Don't just have the plan of God. How are you going to walk that out? God may speak to you and say, I want you to spend more time with me this year. Oh, praise God. My goal for 2020 is to spend more time with God. Write it down. I'm going to spend more time with God. That's as far as you get. I can tell you when 2021 rolls around, you will have spent no more time with God than you did in 2019. Do you want to know why? Because all you did is just wrote it down as a goal that you wanted to fulfill, but you didn't even think about how you're going to fulfill that goal. The reason you're not fulfilling it now is because you're not adjusting your time properly to make that plan come to pass. You now have to go into operation mode of saying, if I'm going to spend more time with God, that means something else has got to get cut out. I got to make a plan. I got to take something else out. And put God in. And if I don't make a plan to do that, guess what? It ain't going to happen. You're already in a habit mode. Of which is not spending as much time with God as you think you should. If God's telling you to spend more time with Him. You think that's going to change just because He told you to do it and you wrote it down? No. You're going to have to get diligent to make a plan to fulfill the plan. Make it plain. How am I going to do this? How am I going to spend more time with God? Am I going to get up an hour earlier? Am I going to start turning the TV off at night? What am I going to do? Somehow you got to make a plan and then you got to walk that out. And if you'll do it, then when 2021 comes, guess what? You'll be closer to God. But it won't happen. I'm telling you, I've done this, church. I've done this for 30 years, uh, as a pa- almost 30 years as a pastor, where I've written a goal before. I want to spend more time with God. End of the year, I had actually spent less most of the time, not more. You know why? I didn't make a plan of changing my schedule to make that happen. And if you don't make a plan to change your schedule, guess what? It's going to stay the same. You know what you're going to do after about six months? Man, I need to spend more time with God. And away you go doing what you're normally doing every day. You know what you're going to do at the end of nine months? Boy, I sure need it. I'm old, man, the year's almost over. I need to spend some more time with God. But I'm really busy. Come on, somebody. So you got to get the plan, but you got to then do what? Make a plan to fulfill it. Number three, what he's telling you to do with the vision here, don't give up on God's goals for your life. Don't give up on God's goals for your life. So I've got to do what? Write down my God-given goals. When I make the plan, I've got to have a plan to fulfill it. And I've got to do what? Not give up on that goal. Amen. Don't give up. Though it tarries, wait for it. Don't give up. Amen. Don't give up. If it don't come to pass in a week or two weeks or two months, don't give up. Amen. If God gave you the goal, stick with it. Amen? Yes. Amen? Yes. Number four, and this is found in verse four, stay in faith. Keep speaking and thanking God for that vision. Stay in faith. Exercise some faith. If you're not going to exercise faith for the goal, it ain't going to happen. Come on, somebody. What does faith do? Believes it in the heart, speaks it with the mouth, and acts upon it. So you're going to have to exercise some faith to see that vision come to pass. Could I get an amen? All right. Now, I'm still talking about number one. I'm going to barely interject number two in here because there's not a whole lot of others we're going to add to this. We'll do these Wednesday night. But I'm still on number one because now we want to talk about practical keys to fasting. Practical keys to fasting. Let me help you with some. Because again, obviously the first thing of what most people think of is just fasting the food alone. True. You're going to fast food in some way if you truly are going to fast biblically. But it doesn't mean you have to fast all three days of every single meal. First and foremost, when it comes to fasting, realize this. If you've never fasted full three days without food, I would make sure first and foremost that a doctor is not going to say that this is not something you should be doing. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you may not have some health issues, that that could be a challenge to you to fast three full days of food. 
Others of you work jobs to where you're actually working so hard on the job, that would be very difficult to do. Or about the third day, you might actually pass out on the job. So it's okay to supplement with liquid supplements that will give your body the nutrients it needs, but you're still not eating food. Well, that's cheating. No, you're giving your body what it needs to function every day at work. If you can't take off of work, you know, most effective prayer and fasting is you take off of work, you go off somewhere, you know, by yourself and you hang out for three days with God. But most people today aren't going to be able to do that. But it doesn't mean you still can't fast and pray. Amen. Amen. So it's okay to supplement with actual types of supplements, you know, like meal replacement stuff, because you're not actually eating a full meal. Most of them have no sugars in them. I'd stay away from the ones that do, because then you're just, again, you're just feeding your flesh more of what it wants. But you can give it the nutrients it needs to obviously continue to function, you know, have cognitive thinking (laughs) on the job, not pass out when you go to work today. Amen. So you need to obviously understand all that. But let me give you nine practical keys to fasting in the context of fasting and praying. Number one, if you're starting off fresh and anew, start with a meal a day. So out of the three days, guess what you could do? Choose one meal a day. Choose one meal, breakfast, lunch, dinner. Well, I already do that. Well, then actually add another one to it. Some people say, well, I don't already eat breakfast. Okay, fine, but if you're already, if you're already in that routine, then, right. then choose to pick a lunch time or a dinner time for the next three days that you won't eat a lunch or a dinner. So take of those three days, if you're starting off and you've not done this for three full days, you can start off by saying, I'm going to fast lunch all three days. You know what I'm going to do in place of eating lunch? Go get in your prayer closet. Go talk to God. Or you might do dinner or you might do breakfast. But if you're starting off, number one, you can at least start with a meal a day. Because true fasting is some form of abstinence of food. Number two, what should you do while you're fasting? Drink plenty of water. There's nothing in the Bible that says you're breaking a fast by drinking water. You are not. Your body needs the water, especially when you're fasting. I encourage you to increase the intake of your water while you're fasting. Which, by the way, doctors would tell you fasting is very healthy for you. And drinking a lot of water helps flush out a lot of the toxins from the junk we eat. So drink lots of water. Amen. Number three, do what? We've already said it multiple times. Pray, meaning what? Get alone with God. Get alone with God. If you're not going to get alone with God during these times of fasting and prayer, it's not going to really help you very much. You're going to waste a lot of good opportunity. Amen? Amen. Number four, I referenced it already, supplement if needed. Doesn't mean you have to, but again, I know for some of you guys that work physical jobs, we've got some guys in our church before that have fasted all three days and won't eat food, but they work physically hard every day. And again, it's not wrong to supplement if you have to. You know, one of those little shake-up meal things to kind of help you out. Amen? Number five, one of the other things you can do, and I encourage it no matter what you do on this fast. Are you ready? Fast pleasant breads. Number five, fast pleasant breads. This is talked about in the Old Testament. What are pleasant breads? Get rid of all sweets. Get rid of all sugars. Come on, man. All your desserts, gone for three days. All your little snack thing, gone for three days. Get get rid of all the pleasant breads. So if you are still going to be eating at some point during those three days, make it staple items. Not all the desserts and junk. I'd encourage you to get rid of all sugar for three days. You'll watch your body rebel. I'm serious. Uh, Doctors will tell you, I believe it, man. Even Christian doctors will tell you. uh, There's something far more addictive than cocaine or heroin or any other such drug. Sugar. Don't believe it? Try to stop it. Just try to take it out of your diet. See how you do. Because your body going to rebel big time when all of a sudden it's not getting... And you understand, we're not talking about just cutting out the dessert. Do you look at anything you buy? Does it have high fructose sugar in it? Syrup in it? That's sugar. So I'm just telling you, it's good to fast pleasant breads during those days. Amen. Amen. Number six, everybody should do this to some degree. Fast media. Fast media. Now, if you see me on Facebook, don't be saying, well, pastor didn't fast Facebook. I'm not on there reading everybody's posts. I have people that follow me all year long. I'm going to give you on Wednesday night some of our records of where our ministry goes. And the literal hundreds of countries that we're in has a ministry, one of which is my blogs. 
And one year during fasting, I stopped doing my blog. I started getting emails from people. Where's your blog? Would you quit, quit sharing your, your scriptures every day? I need those scriptures every day. Come on, man. What's the deal? So I still go on social media and post uh, my blogs every day, but I wouldn't be going on social media and doing your normal routine of, of I like what some of you do. Hey, uh, I'm, I'm going into a time. Don't, again, don't, don't announce. I'm going into fasting and prayer, everybody. Just say, hey, I'm going to be spending some time with God the next few days. So if you need to contact me, I ain't going to be on social media. Right. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Joshua. Glory to God. What other media should you fast? Television. Amen. Turn the TV off. Some of you may have withdrawals for three days just over that alone. But I'm telling you, you should fast media. Why? I'm not here to hear from the world. That's right. These three days, I'm going to hear from God. Amen. Yes. So, number seven, I've already addressed this. Please make sure you have no health issues. When it comes to fasting, you do want to know that you don't have any health issues. Number eight, I brought this up. Make your family aware. Let your family know when you're fasting of what meals you're fasting so that they're on the same page and you're not obviously having them get a big meal ready and now all of a sudden you're not going to eat it. Number nine, we already brought this up. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Get tuned into the Spirit. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Now, I'd be praying a lot in the Holy Spirit over those three days. But I would definitely, for sure, include it in the start of your time of prayer and fasting. Everybody get those? Yes. Nine practical keys to fasting. Start with a meal a day. If you don't want to do the full three days, start with a meal a day. Number two, what should you do? Drink plenty of water. Number three, pray. Get alone with God or it's pretty much useless. Number four, supplement if needed. Five, make sure you fast what? Pleasant breads. Dessert, sugars, gone. History, nothing for three days of, of those type of things. <clears throat> Number six, fast media. Turn your TV off. Get off social media. Get in your prayer closet. Talk to God. Seven, make sure you have no health issues. Eight, make your family aware. Nine, pray in the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. All right, Philippians chapter three. Right. We're moving off of point number one now. <laughs> Well, that was a lot, Pastor. Yeah, because it's the most important part. You need to know God's plan for 2020. Tell me why you need to know God's plan for 2020. It will stand. It cannot be overthrown. And I can't just have that plan. I got to make a plan of how to fulfill it. How am I going to do that? You look at people just from a natural perspective of the world, of people that are successful in the world. You know what they do? They get a plan. They get a vision, something they want to accomplish. You know, God gave us this ability as humans. Yeah. <clears throat> and he wants us to fulfill it. But how much more powerful when we're fulfilling what is his plan? Yeah. Can I help you with something else? Yeah. <clears throat> That's two of you in the back. Yeah. Realize that when you start fulfilling God's plan, that doesn't mean everything goes the way you thought. Now, don't, don't go down this left or right ditch thing. Well, if I'm in the plan of God, man, all the demons in hell are going to come after me. And that's not always true. Not necessarily. <clears throat> but it doesn't mean you may not face some opposition right. as you're walking out God's plan. Amen? <clears throat> well, if I'm in God's plan, everything goes just hunky door and there's never a problem. That's not true either all the time. Right. Sometimes you do face opposition. The point I'm trying to make is don't think that because you got God's plan that it's a done deal. Now you need to plan how to walk it out and don't back down and don't give up. Amen? Amen? So that's all under fasting and prayer. Don't just fast, pray. Amen. Don't just pray, fast. And some real practical things on fasting. Are you in Philippians chapter 3 yet? Yes. All right, Philippians chapter 3. Turn quickly. Okay. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 3. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Are you there now? Yes, sir. All right. Paul said, not that I have already, uh, have already attained or am already perfected, but I do what? I press on. That I may what? Lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me for what Jesus has accomplished and done and wants me to do. I'm going to do what press on that. I can lay hold of that 13 brethren. I do not count myself 
to have apprehended but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are ahead. 14, I press toward the goal. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, twice he talked about pressing on here. In, in three verses, two times he talked about pressing on. Verse 12, I'm not fully perfected yet. I have not attained to all that I know Jesus has for me. But guess what? I'm still pressing on. That's right. Why? That I can lay hold. Amen. 13, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. I've told you this before, and I'm going to tell it to you again. The words I do, of course, italicized were not in the original language. And in this verse, when you look at it in the context of the Greek, it does a disservice to the truth of the verse. Even the punctuations, because there was no punctuations in the original Greek language. It was all added by English translators. It actually reads this way. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended but one thing. I... Do not count myself to have apprehended but one thing. There is this one thing that I have gotten a hold of that I know is vitally important for me if I want to walk in what God has for my life. Yes. Amen. What is that one thing? Forgetting those things which are behind and doing what? Reaching forward to those things which are ahead. How? Pressing toward the goal. Amen. So the context is clear. Paul is telling me and you, he didn't say, brethren, uh, he didn't say it in this way, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. No, he says, I have not counted myself to, appreh to have apprehended, to lay hold of a lot of things in my life, everything that I know I could, but there is this one thing that I have laid hold of that I know is vital to me getting in the future of what God has for me as a goal. I got to do what? I got to forget what's behind Number two on your checklist. We're going to give you an opportunity in about 10 minutes. You got to release 2019. You got to forget the things of the past. You got to forget failed goals. You got to forget any form of things that didn't come to pass. Anything at all that may not have been fulfilled. Any type of hardships. Any wrongs that have been done to you. Anybody that's wronged you, on and on we could go. Listen, obviously those things should have already been in your past, but if they're not, they need to be. They need to be. So I need to let go of what's behind me because, again, if I don't, I'm not going to be able to go forward to what's ahead of me. Now, one of the things we're going to talk about tonight is there is such a thing as stepping into faith in a goal God has for you of, say, an area of deliverance or an answer to something you've been believing God for, of something that's held you bound. Tonight, I would encourage you, you've got an opportunity to say, after 2019, I'm releasing that. That's going to be in my past. That's not going with me into 2020. I'm releasing faith tonight to say I'm free from that. I'm free from that old way of thinking. I'm free from that old form of bondage. I'm free from that old, I'm free from that. No, these things are not going to hold me bound anymore. Now, it won't do any good if you don't exercise faith for it. Mm -hmm. But you got an opportunity tonight Amen. of something you don't want to go with you into 2020. Right. And everybody, I'll guarantee you, if you can't think of something, come spend about five minutes with me and I'll help you. Because right. all of us got some things we need to obviously walk away from still that we shouldn't be taking with us into 2020. Amen. Amen. Right? Amen. So we need to forget those things as well. But how do we do that? So the point number two of your checklist for uh, the new years to do what? Forget what's behind. Mm -hmm. Amen. Number three, you got to press toward the goal. You got to press toward the goal. Guess what that means? It ain't going to happen just because God told it to you. You got to press toward that goal. You got to use some actual faith and some effort to be able to exercise faith and stick with it to see that goal come to pass. What do you want to see of what God spoke to you in 2020 come to pass? Well, guess what? It ain't going to happen just because God told you. Right. You're going to have to press into it. Yes. Again, meaning what? There can be opposition. Yes. And guess where the majority of the opposition comes from? Thank you. Yes. It ain't coming from natural circumstances. 
The devil will use natural circumstances to do what? Bring thoughts, ideas, and suggestions to you of trying to get you to stop what? Pressing on. To give up, to quit. Tell your neighbor, I'm not a quitter and you shouldn't be either. If you're going to get God's goals in your life, listen guys, the only reason Christian Faith Fellowship still exists coming up on 30 years this Easter is because God told me to raise this church up and He hasn't told me to quit. There have been a lot of opposition to that. There have been a lot of years gone by that I would have believed we would have had a building by now that hasn't happened yet. Some of that was my fault. Some of that's not. But the point I'm telling you is, you got a choice. You can either pre- keep pressing toward the goal of God. And here's what's cool. If you're pressing towards the goal of God, guess what? You are actually accomplishing things on the way. Much of which you don't even realize you're accomplishing. Even before the ultimate goal is fulfilled. Because if you're pressing towards that goal, some things are changing. They're not staying the same. Amen? Because you keep pressing forward, praise God. Years ago, I keep saying I'm going to do it again. I should have done it tonight. <clears throat> Years ago when we were in Roanoke one night, some of you might remember this. I preached on this going into a New Year message one time. Had an usher on that side of the sanctuary and one on that side. And I had, they each had a rope in their hand and I held on the other two parts of the ropes. <clears throat> and I had a sign hanging on this one and I had a sign hanging on this one. Remember what they said? Past and future. And I'm standing there holding both of them and I stood up and I looked at everybody and said, where am I going? Nowhere. If I got a hold of both of them, I'm going nowhere. But what happens if I let go of the past and I reach around with this hand and use it to grab the rope over here and start pressing towards the future? Where am I going now? Towards my God-given goal. So you got to press into what God has for you and that means you got a plan of how to do that. Can I get a better amen? Paul said it, I press, verse 14, toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You walking in God's goal for your life in 2020, I promise you will be a part of your upward call <clears throat> because it's fulfilling a heavenly part of your calling. Amen? Amen? So the three things I've given you tonight, number one, fast and pray. And we've talked about why that's significant. We've talked about how to do that, both the praying part and the fasting part, so you can hear from God. Number two, you got to do what? Release the past. Right. Now, we're talking about obviously releasing things of anything of your life, of harm that's been done to you, wrong that's been done to you, challenges you've gone through. They're behind you. How do I release them? You stop thinking about them. You don't keep meditating on them. You don't keep going over and over again in your mind. But how am I going to do that? How am I going to release the past? Here's the problem. Most people don't know how. And it keeps coming back. Our Overcomer series. You got to have verses. You got to have a scripture. Because the only way you counter these thoughts is not with a thought, but with the spoken word. You got to understand the way the devil keeps you in the past is by bringing thoughts to you of the past. You don't overcome those by just one time saying, I forget that. I'll guarantee you, you're not going to deal with it unless you do what? Have a scripture to challenge it and to cast that thought, that thought down with a verse. Amen. So, number one, in relationship to your goal, I would have some scripture to go with it. I'd have some verses to back it up. Number two, and you're forgetting the past, you should have some scriptures to deal with anything of the past that you're letting go. You ought to have some verses to deal with anything of the past of what you're letting go. Because I promise just because you commit tonight to say I'm forgetting and letting them go doesn't mean the devil's going to let it go. Well, what am I going to do when he comes? I am going to use the word of God. The way you overcome this life that you're dealing with is the battleground of the mind. And we're talking it again about it in this series about the overcomer. Because if you understand who you are and he falsely accuses you, the only way you overcome that false accusation is you better have a verse. You better have some scripture that tells you you're justified. You better have some scripture that tells you you're reconciled. You better have some kind of a verse that tells you God's not mad at you. And he's not going to punish you. Are you here? Your thought's not going to change that. Your mouth will. 
people still can't seem to get it in Ephesians where it talks about the armor of God. All the other parts of the armor besides the sword of the Spirit are defensive weapons by you simply having knowledge of all that you have in Christ Jesus. But the one that causes the enemy to stand back and all of a sudden be pushed back is called the sword of the Spirit, which is defined there as the Word of God. You know what the word word is there? Rhema, which means what? you got to speak it. What do you need to speak? God's Word. You don't have to quote chapter and verse, but you better know a scripture that you can decree with your mouth at least to know that I'm backing it up with the Word of God. Jesus was tempted three times. I've taught you this. In the wilderness, Satan came to him and tempted him three times. How did he come to him? How did Satan come to him? The same way he comes to me and you. He didn't come to him physically. Because otherwise, it would have been totally different of the way he deals with us. But it's not any different. Well, the Bible says that, that Satan came to him. Sure, he can come to you with a thought. He don't have to appear to you. It's called fiery darts of the wicked one. Amen? Well, he, he one time showed him this picture. Yeah, do you think he really took him up on the temple and showed him? No, he in his mind painted a picture through a thought. So how did Jesus counter every one of those times that the enemy came to him? It is written. You are not going to get rid of your past if you don't start using your mouth to deal with those thoughts when they come. you got to use the Word of God. Amen? And that's a part of number three, pressing now forward into what God has for my future. Because I'm now declaring the Word of God about it. We pray that you are blessed by the message Pastor Baker shared with you today. For more spiritual resources that can help you in your walk with God, or to invite Pastor Baker as a guest speaker, just go to our website at cffchurch.com. You will find additional teachings by video, audio, and printed resources that will be a blessing to you. May God's very best be yours.